most people in responsible uh, positions know that it causes problems. And certainly the wireless industry does. No question about it. In many ways, seem it's just like the tobacco industry. They knew that their product caused cancer and death and disability and knew it was addictive, yet they claimed up until like the late 1990s were testifying before Congress that it didn't, that it wasn't addictive, that it didn't cause cancer. Mm -hmm. But then they finally were called out and you know the, the truth was no. It's no surprise that you don't know about this because you've been cleverly manipulated by a very sophisticated wireless industry strategy that far exceeds the cleverness of the tobacco industry. Do you want to know what it is? Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body Mind Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host, Seamland, and our guest today is Dr. Joseph Mercola. Dr. Mercola runs one of the largest and oldest health websites online, Mercola.com. He's also a best-selling author, speaker, and physician. Dr. Mercola, welcome back to the show. Well, thanks for having me, Seam. Appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here and share some exciting information about EMFs. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, this time we're trying to do a, like, like another follow-up episode uh, since the last yeah. time we talked. And the last time we talked, you just published your last book, uh, Keto Fast. So uh, yes. what yes. have you been up to since that time? Well, lots of things. You know, I think I've published probably 16 books or so and I've uh, made <laughs> the decision not to write any more books for quite a while and instead write peer-reviewed papers. And you know, one of the recent ones I completed, I still have to submit it for publication, is on uh, blood flow restriction training and mm -hmm. the exciting benefits that has to improving longevity. Because, I mean, you get it at a deep and profound level, but most people in the uh, longevity movement don't understand the importance of, of maintaining high quality muscle mass. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is really fallen by the wayside. They'll, they'll uh, superficially acknowledge it, but they don't really promote it as an integral part of the therapy. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like muscle mass is really critical oh. for just metabolic flexibility and uh, functionality throughout your lifetime. And like for older people, yeah, definitely like blood flow restriction is like an awesome biohack in a sense that you load your muscles with, you know, uh, heavy stimulus without the actual heavy loads or the heavy weights, <laughs> so to say. Yeah, yeah. So you can get, because the problem with, you're right, with the elderly is that they uh, aren't able to really do the, the high load resistance training that you can when you're younger. and and many pe disabled people or injured people have the same scenario. So with this blood flow restriction training, you can really radically, uh, well, not radically, but, but allow your body to achieve similar benefits of high load training with the low loads mm -hmm. and get almost identical benefits. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can have an, uh, completely another podcast oh, yes, about this yeah. <laughs> topic, so we're going to keep it uh, that for this moment. Uh, so your upcoming book, uh, it's going to be about 5G and EMF, am I right? Yeah, it is. It's actually coming out in February. It's awesome. called EMF. EMF apostrophe D. <laughs> wow, that's, that's a cool and title. And it talks about how 5G impacts your cellular health, mm. uh, which, which is uh, something that most people don't appreciate. Certainly the general public, probably your audience uh, is wiser mm -hmm. because uh, you know, they have access to your material. And by the way, your, your book, Meta Metabolic Autophagy, is just crazy good. I mean, that really is one of the best books on the, on the subject. Mm -hmm. So if anyone hasn't uh, gotten that book, I strongly encourage them to do that and read it really carefully because it's just it's a primer for molecular biology as it's related to health. You do mm -hmm. such a good job. Yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> yeah. Rumor, rumors go. So, five uh, G and EMF. Um, you know, you know. Yeah, a lot of people may have heard that these EMFs are dangerous for their health, but they're not really sure how or uh, why. So mm -hmm. let's un let's kind of unpack it. You know, wh what's what's the maybe current state of research about five uh, G and EMF? Well, you can. Not all EMFs are harmful. Uh, certainly, visible light and sunlight, specifically, is an EMF, a type of EMF, mm. and really exposure to that. I, I, I think we both agree uh, is really an important part of staying healthy and improving your longevity. So, you uh, that so we you know it's just not a general blanket statement against all EMFs, but that the the newer uh, EMFs related to technology that's been developed in the last century or so. Uh, provide some problems and basically you can divide them into two types of radiation one is ionizing radiation the other is non-ionizing those are the two 
primary divisions. And there's really not much controversy that ionizing radiation like x-rays or gamma rays Mm -hmm. is harmful to biology. I mean, no one's going to disagree with that. And these are very short wavelengths with lots of energy and enough energy so they can actually directly break the covalent bonds in DNA. Mm-hmm. Uh, so no, no dispute there. The dispute becomes a non-ionizing ratio, the type that's in your cell phone or your Wi-Fi router uh, that they claim doesn't cause biological damage because they're only looking at thermal effects, the ability of your, those wavelengths to cause heat. And uh, many people aren't aware that the frequency that your cell phone and Wi-Fi uses is, is really a, a form of microwave radiation. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, it's in the same frequency range. And, th- and that's important because we know that microwaves are used to heat, heat food or heat other items. So, um, and that's the primary focus that uh, sci- conventional science has taken to determine if these exposures from these wavelengths are problematic. Uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately for one side that they, they really don't cause much thermal heat damage to your body. Um, that's, that's pretty well proven and documented, but that's not the way they cause biologic damage. It's, it's somewhat similar to ionizing radiation, except because this, the wavelengths are longer, they don't have enough energy and they cannot break the DNA bonds directly like x-rays can. Mm-hmm. But the, the way x-rays, I mean, that's one way x-rays cause damage. The other way is that they, ca- they spin off hydroxyl free radicals actually within the nucleus. Uh, they're easily able to penetrate all those tissues and uh, the hydroxyl radical, which is causes most of the damage, doesn't live very long. It lives like a billionth of a second. So um, the ones that are created in the mitochondria where most of them are created don't live long enough to travel to the nucleus. So they can only, only really cause mitochondrial damage. So the x-rays, however, spin off those, those hydroxyls right in the nucleus. But what the ionizing radiation does is it in the mitochondria and all cell, throughout the entire cell, the exposure to these wavelengths uh, causes the formation of another oxidative stress uh, that ultimately is nearly as pernicious as hydroxyl, which is carbonate free radicals. Mm-hmm. And it does that by increasing nitric oxide, not nitrous, nitric oxide and superoxide, which c- almost immediately combines to form peroxynitrite, which then spins off to carbonate free radicals in the nucleus and causing the damage. So the actual mechanism biological damage is pretty similar. So then you might say, well, what's, so what, you know, what's it, you know, is it cancer? Yes, it definitely can increase the risk of cancer, but there are also other symptoms that people get. And if anyone is watching this knows of someone or maybe even themselves personally that has an arrhythmia, Mm -hmm. typically that would be like atrial fib, atrial flutter, uh, they absolutely need to look at their exposures to EMF because there's, it's, it's clearly documented that exposures can, to these EMFs can increase your risk, risk of rates of arrhythmias. Mm-hmm. But they also increase um, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, uh, ADHD, which is uh, somewhat similar. And then autism on the other spec on the, on the other side, which is at the beginning. So, and they and they increase the rates of infertility. So you, you want the subtitle for this book. Actually, the title was initially going to be the exponent existential extinction or extinction event, hmm. uh, because if you've got people that are being born, up to one third to one half of them coming down with autism, and half of the elderly population with neurodegenerative diseases. And then a good, you know, 75% of the rest of the population infertile. I mean, that's a prescription for social collapse or, yeah. you know, or human collapse. It's, and you know, we're heading in that direction unless we start to wake up. Mm-hmm. Um, and fortunately, there are things that you can do to mitigate against that. Yeah, it's uh, so definitely uh, crazy to think about it because, um, you know, it's such a new phenomenon in the yeah, human, yeah. human environment. Relative. Like literally just, just a, even even I myself, who'm like a millennial or very young, I, I, don't, I, have, I, I spent a lot of my childhood without like technology or these uh, mm-hmm. EMS, and I spent a lot of time in nature. And literally, like it's it's only like the maybe last I don't know ten years where it's become like a more pro- predominant part of our lives, and uh, the, the exposure kind of exponentially increases all the time. And uh, I would say that. You, you mentioned that it's almost like uh, being in a microwave all the time, constantly. So even if some yes, people, even if some, yeah, even, 
even if some people would think that microwaving their food isn't necessarily that bad, I would still think that they would agree that being constantly in a microwave <laughs> is definitely not a good idea. Yeah, speaking of that, you do really do not want to microwave in your house. I mean, there's right. no reason for it because even, even when it's supposedly it's shielded, but the, the safety levels of that radiation exposure are literally orders, many orders of magnitude beyond biological safety. Mm. So do not use that. But I, th I think another aspect of the exposure to this is, is it, it affects a biomolecule that both you and I are passionate about, which is NAD+. Mm. And uh, when you cause the DNA damage through the mechanism I mentioned earlier in the oxidative stress and the DNA mm -hmm. breaks, you cause an enzyme, which was previously called PARP, poly-ADP ribose polymerase, which creates ribose polymers that causes or that allows the DNA repair enzymes to go in and fix those breaks. Uh, but every time that gets activated, you're sucking up 150 NAD plus molecules because... Wow. Uh, you know, ADP is actually integrated as part of the NAD molecule. So it just mm -hmm. takes it, strips it right out and, and converts it back to nicotinamide. And, you know, you've, the end result of that is you develop, it, it is literally the single biggest source of NAD consumption in the body. So we know even without that exposure, as you age, that's a huge problem is, is to yeah. keeping your NAD levels high. So, I mean, this is a great way to keep your NAD levels high without doing any precursors or expensive supplements right right yeah yeah it's uh yeah it's really important in a sense that nad essentially governs almost yeah virtually all physiological processes and including repair uh and these things such as you know the oxidative stress you experience from emf and you know all the other uh sources of stress in our life then it's going to just uh, deplete your nad pools even faster so to say yeah yeah, so that's, uh, you know, just by, by slowing down the leaks, <laughs> you yeah. can have radical improvement of your health. I mean, NAD is just, you know, I think we're both in agreement. It's one of the mo most magnificent biomolecules out there and, hmm. you know, really yeah. focus on optimizing those levels if you want to stay healthy and live long. There's no question. Yeah. Uh, what are, like, other sources of, uh, you know, this harmful uh, EMF in addition to microwaves and, uh, like, cell phones? Well, the most common sources that we have are your Wi-Fi router. Uh, and, you know, many people become concerned when they, those who are aware of EMF potential damages, they're concerned when they see a cell phone tower outside their home. And yes, that can provide some challenges, but it's nothing compared to the Wi-Fi router in your home. Yeah. So that, the Wi-Fi router in your home and your cell phone are the two biggest threats. Uh, and thankfully, they are the ones that you have most control over. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's really easy to, to do the minimum, which is to turn off your Wi-Fi router at night. Yeah. Ideally, you would take it the next step and not have a Wi-Fi router. Mm -hmm. You would have cables. And, you know, I think you even remember, and certainly many people listening to this, that, you know, 20 years ago, no one, no one virtually connected to the Internet through a, through a wireless. It was all yeah. wired connections. Yeah. This wireless is radic, rad, relatively new. And I think what, what uh, expedited it was the introduction of the iPhone. That was less about 15 years ago. Yeah. So we did not connect to the internet via wireless. So you can easily do it. And you know, this 5G, which we'll talk about in a minute, minute, it is just an attempt by industry to capitalize on this and make loads of money because everyone understands, and I agree, that we need higher bandwidth. We can do so mm -hmm. much more things with higher bandwidth. But we don't need it wirelessly. You can get every bit of bandwidth you can and less expensively with fiber optic cable. Oh, well. But they, they refuse to do that. Wow. So. Yeah, I was under the impression that, or yeah, like the 5G is faster than the internet yes. we had in, well, in, 4G the, in the past. Like, yeah. up, up to by 100, 100 times. I mean, wow. it is significantly faster, yeah. two orders of magnitude, yeah. Yeah, and you can say that it's as fast if you just use a cable. Yes, you can get 5G speeds. I mean, 5G speeds have been available for a long time on fiber optics. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the innovations in transmission and the, the cable technology is actually easier to implement in wireless technology so that you can, you can get higher and higher speeds on the fiber than you can with the wireless. Mm. Yeah. And not pose a risk. I, you know, there, there was a, actually, as we're recording this, there was a meeting in Europe that uh, the wireless industry was successfully able to 
uh, prevent or sent, uh, keep the, their ability to deploy 5G despite the amazing threat at, at about 27 gigahertz mm -hmm. that it poses to the entire weather casting forecast of the planet. So yeah, 27, 27 gigahertz is like the frequency of water vapor coming up and it's essential to monitor that for predicting stor storms and hurricanes and tornadoes. Mm -hmm. and, and the 5G uh, uh, implementation is going to prevent that. So it's going to radically impair our ability to predict weather. And it's crazy. Oh. And then you combine that with SpaceX, SpaceX just last a few weeks ago got additional or sought is seeking additional permission to launch 30,000 more satellites. They already had a permission for 12,000. Wow. So they're going to have 42,000 satellites in low Earth orbit broadcasting 5G internet all over the world. Oh, wow, great. Crazy. That's 20 times more satellites than exist up there now. That's insane. <laughs> yeah, it is. If you think about it, it's like it's, and not many people know it. I mean, it's in there if you look it up online, but you know, it's just yeah. it's, most people there, aren't there, aware. There must be like already, you know, I've heard some case studies about uh, the harmful effects of 5G already. Uh, mm -hmm. why, is it, why isn't the public or the government aware of this or why aren't they doing anything about it? Well, the public and the government are two different entities and the government, most people in responsible uh, positions know that it causes a problem. And certainly the wireless industry does. No question about it. In many ways, seem it's just like the tobacco industry. Hmm. You know, they, they, they knew that their product caused cancer and death and disability, yet they pers and, and knew it was addictive, yet they claimed up until like the late 1990s, where their CEOs of all the major uh, tobacco companies were testifying before Congress that it didn't, that it wasn't addictive, that it didn't cause cancer. Mm -hmm. But then they finally were called out and you know, the, the truth was known. Well, mm -hmm. that, they were able to d defer the knowledge of the truth, wide, wide acceptance of the knowledge for five decades. Mm -hmm. And this is despite the fact that the Surgeon General, the CDC, and the EPA all recognized and warned the public that smoking causes cancer. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, that is not the same with the wireless industry. The wireless industry, thanks, thanks to their very sophisticated and clever str strategic interventions, has essentially captured all the federal regulatory agencies. Wow. Which the tobacco industry never was able to do. So you have the the regulatory agencies that are uh, de um, delegated the assignment of protecting the public are not doing it because they've been bought out by by the wireless industry. And you've got uh, the chief lobbyist of the wireless industry, Tom Wheeler, who was appointed by Obama to be the head of the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, or I'm sorry, the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, in the United States for four years. I mean, that's like the, the most egregious example of the fox guarding the henhouse. So it's no surprise that they've been able to act these legislations. And uh, 1990, in 1996, they passed this act that was just crazy that essentially prohibits any local governmental agency, like your city or your, even your state, from prohibiting the installation of a wireless antenna on the grounds of health. Well, it, it, I mean, it's just it's just shocking that they're able to to influence the government that much. So you've that, that I mean, that's a long winded answer, but it's an important to present the backstory to provide that people can understand that it's no it's no surprise that you don't know about this because you've been cleverly manipulated by a very sophisticated wireless industry strategy that far exceeds the cleverness of the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, the truth will be eventually known, but sadly, tens of millions of people will die prematurely as a result of these exposures. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the uh, wireless industry or the telecommunications industry is definitely much more influential than the tobacco industry anyway, because like they're controlling the media or they're, they're con controlling communi communications literally. And uh, that has like a much more profound way of uh, influencing uh, yeah, the, and especially you know, we, you know, as we're recording this, it's uh, right before Thanksgiving in the U.S., so late November 2019, and we're five, almost five months 
yeah, five months past the Google censorship, which has mm. essentially eliminated natural health sites like myself, and I'm not sure if yours has been affected, but all the big ones have been impacted and essentially removed our sites from their search engine. And Google has 90% right. of the search engine's <laughs> uses in the yeah. world. So, you know, when you're eliminating access to that knowledge, how could the average person even figure this out? Almost yeah. you can't. Yeah, yeah, it's like literally putting them into a, like a blindfold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty, pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, so, how predominant is five G already? Like, how are there like a lot of towers in the states already? That's a great question, and it's it's not actually implemented hardly at all in the United States. They've got really beta test sites. There's no city, as far as I'm aware, that has widespread implementation. Mm -hmm. It's just really there. there there's some fake 5Gs and AT&T did the same thing when 4G was first implemented. They had this, their, their 4G, but it was, mm -hmm. it was still just kilobytes per second. And, and they're doing the same trick now, calling it 5G and it isn't true 5G because true 5G is literally, as I said earlier, it's a hundred times faster. You're looking at <laughs> bandwidth speeds of, of close to a gigabyte per second, seven, 800 megs per second. And the for those who don't know, the typical 4G download speed is like 10, 20 megabytes per second. So mm -hmm. pretty small compared to the 5G potential. So th as far as I know, that's not really widely implemented from a cell phone perspective. And interestingly, it was Apple who was responsible for catalyzing that with 4G because it didn't really take off until they they had 4G in their phones. And, and Apple at this point does not have 5G. They'll probably launch it next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, I haven't seen like a lot of uh, any, any uh, I've, seen, I've seen like a maybe few of these fake towers in London yes. and other, other big cities, but I haven't seen uh, in Estonia yet. So <laughs> fortunately, I'm uh, quite away from this, but uh, probably there, Estonia itself is like a very you know, tech savvy, country as well and they're very proud of being like this internet country with everything being online and such so i would imagine it's going to be picked up right quite fast here unfortunately yeah i mean they're you know they they are their um insights on this are clouded every bit as much as in the u.s because of the clever cleverness of the, of the wireless industry and their ability to follow a similar successful strategy that tobacco did and that is you know basically fund uh int research that to dispute the findings that any any reputable scientists come up with that, that mm -hmm. challenges it and actually even despite that the world health organization classified cell phones as a as a class 2b carcinogen oh, really? eight, wow. years, eight years ago wow. but you know what they were wrong it's a class 1a and the study was published last year they uh, the u.s government and their national institutes of health spent 25 million dollars mm -hmm. to fund the N national toxicology program ntp study which definitively showed that not 4g or 5g because that what that was a study because the study was done many years ago just 2g and 3g cause cancer oh, wow. it clearly caused cancer no question and interestingly the wireless industry was was hot to to, to uh, uh i guess suppress that information and they immediately fired the head of the project once he announced it and they replaced mm -hmm. him with someone that tried to downplay the results but then the remesini remesini institute in italy uh, replicated the study and actually was able to confirm it so it really is a class 1a carcinogen yeah yeah very clearly that's true and i think like a part of the problem is also the people themselves that they want faster internet and uh, they're yeah and absolutely. it's like it's like our own society or the civilization itself is driving this need or the desire to have faster yeah. you know bandwidth it's time. enormously convenient there's no question and unlike smoking which has virtually no superficial benefits i mean it mm -hmm. smells bad i mean it just you know it costs money and there's there's virtually no convenience for it but mm -hmm. wireless has enormous convenience so you've got this this captivate, uh, captivating motivation to really be in disbelief and to ignore just ignore the warnings on this and say well the wireless industry says it's okay so it's probably fine yeah. and you're not to believe it and i was even though i was concerned about it and posting information about it as, as long as almost about 20 years ago, I still disbelieved it personally and hadn't adopted strategies to prevent my exposure that wound up actually harming me biologically until, mm -hmm. I, until I became more serious about it about three years ago, which cat is, cat actually catalyzed the writing of this book. Mm -hmm. uh, so what about things like uh, grounding? 
can that be useful for uh, mitigating the effects of uh, EMF? Probably, but not so much in the United States because a, a subset of that, not, not just wireless radio frequency exposures to your cell phone and Wi-Fi, but there's also electrical pollution exposure, which started hmm. much earlier. That was a century ago. And uh, so electrical fields can be an issue. And, and the United States and, well, most of North America, the utility companies don't really put a return wire back to their substations. So as a result, the ground becomes contaminated with, contaminated with these high voltage transits, sometimes called dirty electricity. Mm -hmm. So that can be problematic. So grounding could be potentially counterproductive in the United right. States, unless you're, and that's not true for Europe where you're at. Uh, I think grounded they, cause they do this, the utility companies don't do that. So it's, Fine in, the, in Europe, but not so much in the in the U.S. and North America. But it's, except if you're grounding in the ocean or mm. water, you know, essentially salt water, yeah. then that's true grounding. It's probably the best ground you get anywhere on the planet is is you know in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So, and I actually have a, a, a daily habit where I walk about an hour a day in in the water on the ocean hmm. and then I go swimming it, you know, assuming the, the wind isn't too brisk and it's cold out. So, yeah. you know, cold thermogenesis and we're getting to the time of the year where it's a bit of a challenge to do that, but, but at least I can walk in the water on, on the shore. So, yeah. but uh, yeah, grounding and it is useful. There's no question. Hmm. Um, I've also heard that, uh, you know, or like the idea of hormesis, does it apply yes. to EMF? Like a small dose can be beneficial in uh, small amounts. Yeah, I, was at, I actually wanted to discuss that with you, too, because uh, you're a big fan of hormesis, as am I. Uh, I actually interviewed someone about this for my own site, uh, Lloyd Burrell, who had, who's an EMF educator in the UK. Actually, lives in France, but he's from the UK. And uh, he doesn't have any biology training like you and I do. So he was not believing that it was hormetically beneficial. But I, I tend to believe it is, because it's a biological principle mm -hmm. uh, that if you are having low enough exposure, you're going to cause some damage. And that damage that you're causing will create a uh, response in your body that essentially protects you from future exposures. Mm -hmm. But the only way that that exposure is going to work is if the bulk of the time you have a pretty minimal exposure to these. And mm -hmm. that is going to be as a baseline, having an environment that, where you sleep that has minimal exposure to these frequencies. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you don't, you're, you, you won't be hormesis. It's just, yeah. it's like running a marathon every day, you know, exactly. you're gonna, it's not going to work. You, you yeah, have so, to have the recovery aspect. Yeah, it's so like your body can only adapt to the stress if it has a time to literally recover and rest. But if you're chronically in the environment surrounded by these uh, stimulus then uh, your body is never going to have a chance to fully adapt yeah, and right. uh, yeah one 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 like lit like a good example of hormesis is that with emf uh, i saw this study where they exposed uh, rats to emf around like 400 to 500 hertz for several hours every day and uh, they saw that it increased autophagy in their brains wow. <laughs> and and i think like the reason why autophagy got activated was because like the EMF causes, you know, trauma and physical damage to the brain to a certain extent. And then the body just uh, tried to respond by activating autophagy. So it's like a healing mechanism. But I, I would say like it's a definitely like a net negative <laughs> because like uh, you, can, you can also activate autophagy in the same way by banging your head against the wall <laughs> and uh, <laughs> causing, a similar, causing a similar trauma to your brain. So I think it's not... Yeah, which might be beneficial in the long run. You never know, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't recommend it. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like, it's like, I think, yeah, like the, just a vast amount of the stimulus is uh, too much for our bodies to handle on a chronic basis. And, uh, well, I, you know, it, I'm hoping that it's that case because we are quickly entering into the phase of human development where we're, we're going to be essentially unable to avoid these exposure, especially yeah. with the Starlink SpaceX implementation that's going to be pervasive the entire planet will be bathed in these 5g frequencies you can't escape it anywhere yeah. you go i think like probably to a certain extent people will adapt to it uh in a small way uh, but they do still need like to probably take uh, either precautionary measures uh, or just re increase their recovery strategy so to say to have times for uh, no emf and uh, try to shield their body in some aspects so to say to uh, mitigate some of the exposure because 
you know, if you put like a caveman into New York Times Square, then they're going to get like a massive headache and they're going to just explode. But uh, a, a modern person doesn't barely notice that unless they have not, like maybe spend a lot of time in the wilds and nature where there's no EMF and then they go back into the city. So there's probably some adaptation yeah. that happens. But uh, like I said, yeah, if you're chronically in this, then you yeah, I, don't, I don't know if it's the adaptation, it's just tolerance. And it's, it's just like you hmm. could be exposed to something chronically and you just don't notice it, even though it's still causing you the same biological harm. Yeah. You just not, don't appreciate it because you don't have a baseline reference. Yeah, it's like with caffeine, like if you're <laughs> drinking mm-hmm. coffee all the time, then you don't even notice what it feels like to be, you know, uncaffeinated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, but you mentioned that uh, the sleep aspect, that the sleep you, you need to have, or is very important to have uh, your sleep, you know, uh, non-EMF. Uh, can you elaborate mm-hmm. a, a bit about that? Yeah, because you have, need to optimize your recovery, regeneration, repair during sleep, and that's when it occurs. Uh, and it will, will influence your ability to enter certain stages of sleep, like REM and deep sleep. Mm-hmm. So that, that's one of the primary reasons. And uh, there are a number of strategies you can use. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, turning off the Wi-Fi is really important. Uh, and then, you know, the, it's just shocking, beyond shocking, actually, the number of children and adolescents and teenagers, at least in the United States, who every night sleep with their cell phone on yeah. under their pillow. Yeah. It's, I mean, they're just radiating their brain at night. Yeah. So yeah. that's not what you want to do. It's okay to have your cell phone in your bedroom, but at the minimum, it should be in airplane mode. Yeah. And even then, I would still put it in a Faraday bag. And you get these Faraday bags on Amazon like for five bucks. Mm-hmm. And it, and pretty, even if it's on, the nice thing about a Faraday bag for your phone is that it, if for some reason you forget to turn it off, because you know, for me, I don't have wireless in my house, so I, I use my phone as a Wi-Fi hotspot, and that's how I get my Aura Ring data off, right? Mm-hmm. So if I forget to turn the plane, you know, I, I download the Aura data and I forget to turn it off, then it's a problem. But if I put in a Faraday bag, the signal is, is like 99% muted. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's a nice safeguard. So anyway, at, at, at night, put your phone in airplane mode. So okay to have it next to you on your bed stand but in, and in a Faraday bag. And then the next step would be to shut off the electricity to your room um, because – there's electrical current that goes through the wires and it, it, there are some co- cities in the world or communities where they, the building code requires them in almost all cities, at least in the United States, commercial regulations or code requires it to be in a metal conduit. And the nice thing about a metal conduit is that it's a Faraday cage. So those electrical fields don't come out. Uh, and if you're building a house, that'd be ideal. You put your electric electric wires in, in metal conduit and then that eliminates the problem. Then you really don't have to turn off your electricity at night. But th- most of us don't have that. And th- they we have these plastic shielded uh, cables and wire electric wires in our walls. So turning off the, the electricity will radically reduce your electric field exposure. And uh, there you can do that at the, the, the circuit breaker, which is not really designed to do it. Uh, but so it's better to get these... Um, switches and the one i like in the u.s is called emfkillswitch.com where for relatively inexpensive you get a ul underwriter lab approved device that you can essentially press one button and it can turn off multiple circuits in your house Mm -hmm. so you go dark and if you want it you don't have to traipse through the house and go to the attic or your basement and turn the circuit breaker on you just press one little button and it turns it on Mm -hmm. so it's really convenient and if it's convenient more likely you're going to do it uh, so those are the big strategies. And then you want to get a device to measure these frequencies because EMF is invisible. Um, yeah, that's another yeah. thing. Smoking <laughs> isn't invisible. EMF is. And it, you can't see it, hear it, feel it, touch it. So you have no idea what your exposures are unless you have a device that can show you and tell you what it is. And there are probably hundreds of different devices. The one I like, recommended me by Magda Havis, who is a professor up in uh, Canada who's a real strong EMF advocate, uh, educational advocate, and she recommends Acousticom 2, uh, mm-hmm. which is uh, a little device about the size of a, a pack of cigarettes and can give you a visual and auditory uh, 
display of what your exposures are. So you can measure that in your bedroom. And if, and if you do these things and you still have high radio frequency exposure, because you might be next to a cell phone tower or a smart meter next to you, behind your bedroom and you don't know until you measure it. And then you might have, like, then you need to take additional steps to shield you even further. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, uh, I think awareness is probably uh, the most important part mm-hmm. for it. So like educating people about it and like, yeah, most people tend to put their cell phone under their pillow without even knowing that it's harmful. <laughs> and yeah, and it's, uh, it's even not only going to radiate their brain, but it's also going to disrupt the circadian rhythms like EMF yes. can disrupt the circadian rhythms and the blue light coming from the, the cell phone and such. So it's a, it's a deadly combo and definitely you know, something you yeah. want to avoid. Well, when they're sleeping, there's not much blue light. But, you know, it's, that's reason, even when it's more dangerous. Certainly looking at the phone before you go to bed is not a good thing unless you've got – got some pretty nice filters on it, especially the iPhone. You can pretty much make it red and white. Yeah. So that's not an issue. But, you know, it's the – and and circadian rhythm disruption is certainly one component. But I think the, the continuous RF exposure at night is probably more dangerous than the circadian rhythm disruption. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what about these uh, devices um, that you know say that to say that they can block or shield the uh, EMF, like the blue shield? Yeah, there there exists, and I think that the as a generic category, you can call them harmonizers. Mm-hmm. Uh, that these little patches or pieces of material, electronic circuits, sometimes that you put on with adhesive on the back of your phone or on electronic devices. And uh, they work at a quantum level, supposedly, or biologic, but affect your biology in some way. And, and I, I don't doubt that there are probably some measurable benefits to people, but I, I don't recommend them at all because mm-hmm. they won't shield you from the radiation. Your, your biology is still being exposed to these frequencies and you're still causing the damage we discussed earlier. So uh, in many ways, it gives you a false sense of security and will allow you to persist in your behaviors that are contributing to your premature demise. Right, right. So yeah. I, I, I would caution against them. And, and it, you know, the only devices that shield are shielding materials. Essentially, you've got to turn it off or put it in a, in a shielding case. It's usually a type of metallic fiber uh, for, the, for, the, for the cloths and the, the Faraday bags I mentioned. It's usually a silver fiber. That, mm. that's, but, but you could put it actually in a, in a metal case uh, like a those old cookie tins, you know, that closes completely and that would work too. Hmm. So it's essentially creating a Faraday cage uh, around the device that's emitting the, the signal. Right, right. So uh, salt, salt lamps and shungite crystals don't work. <laughs> no, no. Shungite is that's a good one that's commonly recommended as uh, a strategy to remediate EMF. And, you know, I, I said, okay, well, let me test it. I, I bought some shungite. It doesn't do it. <laughs> anything to to attenuate the signals coming from the RF uh, doesn't change it at all. You think somehow it creates this magic force field around it. It doesn't. Mm-hmm. Now, it may impact your biology in some way at a different level, but I, I really doubt that it's lessening the biologic damage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, but uh, what about uh, grounding uh, sleeping mats? Like uh, I, I was uh, recently talking with uh, Clint Ober, uh, who is like yes. the founder of the grounding movement, and he yeah. he, he has the, these uh, products like the grounding mats for for sleeping. I've known Clint for many years. I have great respect for Clint. He's a, he's a good human being, really is. Love the man. Uh, we have disagreements on this, though. Uh, he obviously has a little bit of conflict of interest, and I, I think he sincerely and truly believes it works. And he he dismisses the concerns about dirty electricity that I mentioned earlier in North America. So we disagree on that. I think it's an issue. I personally wouldn't do it. If I was in Estonia, I would do it, or mm. Europe. But I think I do ground every day, though. I ground when I swim in the morning in my pool, and I ground when I go in the ocean in the afternoon. So I think it's a magnificent strategy, but I wouldn't use the grounding materials, and I don't. I used to prior to my learning of this, and I learned about it through some pretty prominent EMF pioneers like Samuel Milham, who's an MD, PhD, who wrote a, the book, Dirty Electricity, did some groundbreaking research. He's an epidemiologist. His, uh, I think his MP, and I think he has an MPH, was in epidemiology. Mm-hmm. And he essentially studied the two populations in the United States. From 1900 to 1950, there were two distinct populations, the rural areas and the urban areas. And the urban areas were electrified. 
and the rural areas were not, not until the 1950s. So, and it's when you, and he, he graphed all this all out. He got this, he got the numbers and collected it and, and he found that there was a radical increase in chronic degenerative diseases in the urban areas until 19, that continued beyond 1950, but that, that increase did not occur in the rural areas until 1950. And then it came, then the, then the instance came way up and it joined the urban area. So okay. pretty strong, compelling evidence. Obviously, correlation is not causation, but it's very compelling uh, data to suggest that there's some concern here. So mm -hmm. then, and then uh, also Dave Stetzer, who actually creates the Stetzer filters and obviously a conflict of interest, but he worked with uh, Martin Graham, who is a PhD in electro, electro, electrical engineering, I believe, uh, and came, you know, they did the this, this studies and the science and they, they, they pretty much, you know, has some very compelling evidence, which I tend to believe. And for, for whatever reason, Clint, Clint doesn't believe. Hmm. Yeah. So I think, yeah, a lot to do with, uh, maybe, maybe like, uh, chronic exposure or chronic groundedness, uh, probably isn't, isn't, isn't good idea either because then you would, no, no. then you're not going to develop, develop the tolerance. <laughs> no, no. I think chronic groundedness is, is a great strategy, assuming you've got a clean ground. Right. And the, the real issue is that in North America, it's really debatable and controversial whether or not clean ground exists outside of in the oceans or highly remote areas of the United States in some mountain area or something. Yeah. yeah. So I, I would have no worries being grounded 99% of the day if yeah. it was a clean ground. Right. I think, I think it's optimal actually. Yeah, probably. Um, what kind of like a backlash have you received about this topic? Because obviously uh, some people think it's, you know, hogwash, but, but others are just maybe having their own agendas. So uh, what kind of opinions have you heard about different people from different people? Uh, from this topic, none really, uh, you know, <laughs> other <laughs> than being censored in Google in June, uh, but it had nothing to do with the EMFs. But, you know, I, I am an advocate for so many controversial topics, vaccines probably being the most controversial but even recommending the ketogenic diet is is controversial in many communities so yeah. uh I, i'm no um newbie to these types of <laughs> controversy <Yeah. laughs> so uh, i haven't noticed any feedback on this yet and i i, I tend to think i won't because it's i don't know I don't, I don't think they're the wireless industry is going to target me or anything and certainly big pharma has for for you know my exposure exposing their their uh, tactics and strategies right. and, you know, evil, evil deeds in, in my site. So can we talk about the Google thing then a little bit <laughs> like uh, what happened and uh, how did it affect you? Well, our, it's sad in some ways because our traffic went down by two thirds. So we, we used to have a million views a month, un unique views a month mm -hmm. and we're down to like 400,000 now. Right. So, it's essentially two thirds reduction. Um, and it's sad because the, not from a business perspective, because it really didn't affect our revenues much, but it, it, it did affect our mission, which is to really spread this information to people wide and far. So they know that there's another choice and, mm -hmm. you know, Google is part of this process with these tech firms and Facebook being another, uh, that, believe they know better than everyone else and need to limit right. this information, essentially censor it because they think it's a, th a threat for the greater good. Uh, and that's how they justify it. But if you look at it, it's interesting that the companies that the, the, the websites that come up now, when you type in the regular keywords, see, they essentially were not eliminated from Google. My content's still there, but it will never come up in a search. Right. Uh, you can type in my name in a topic and it would come up. But without my name, I would never come up for a, for a keyword. It just doesn't oh, work that way. Crazy. So yeah, essentially our traffic from Google went down by almost 100%. Um, so the, what comes up instead, instead of the topics that we legitimately deserve to be highly ranked for? We were, we were number one, two, or three for thousands of ter health key terms. Mm -hmm. And now what comes up is WebMD, <laughs> Healthline, and Medical News Today. Now, I don't know if you've heard of these sites before, but they are all of these sites are owned by ad agencies. Mm -hmm. And all of these sites use Google ads and they sell ads to either sell junk food or drugs. Mm -hmm. It is so beyond sad. 
I mean, if a, a person sincerely seeking to identify the foundational cause of the disease goes to the internet now and uses the, the default search engine, which 90% of people on the planet uses Google, then they're going to find this crap that yeah. is absolutely not, never deserved to be there other than they have a, a really cozy relationship with business relationship with Google. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and Google has other issues too, because they, they essentially serve surveil you you they have all that they breach your privacy they sell your data it's it's just an evil thing so the way around this is that everyone should know they should not use google or google products that means no google search the best search engine as far as i can discern out there now is is one out of france it's called quant q w a n t quant Mm-hmm. quant.com and 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 to not use the chrome browser because everything at google will track every keystroke you're making on chrome they know what you're doing mm-hmm. and, and i'm this is not arbitrary this is truth yeah. and in fact even when it, just this last week ago they, they bought this company called ascension and have literally downloaded millions of people's health data without any permission from them wow i mean they're they're uh, violation of privacy issues is just tremendous so anyway you can use a browser brave and and in brave it will actually it's based on the same software chromium Mm -hmm. as google is so it's really easy to transfer your uh extensions your favorites your bookmarks and uh and actually select a search engine and you can select quant in brave so don't you don't use chrome don't use google search use quant and brave don't use gmail because every every character you type in gmail is noticed by google hmm. um so um and there's there's a lot of other email clients you can use but stay away from google so those are the three big things and then the what i switched shifted you probably already have an apple phone but i never did until this year uh but i had android all the way because i was a big google fan and initially when they when they first came out they i think their intentions were pure and they really followed their motto, which is do no evil. But now they took that model away years ago because they're doing evil every second. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I get, a, get, a, get an Apple iPhone because they're far more diligent about preserving your, honoring your privacy. Uh, but any non-Apple phone is essentially using Android by default. I don't know that any, there's any other operating system on the phone other than Android or, or iOS. Mm-hmm. So if you're using Android, that's Google and they're they're copying all your data or they're stealing your data essentially. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty crazy situation. Another one of those, because uh, like most people are using Google all the time throughout their entire day in some shape or form. And uh, you're like, they don't really, you know, even though they may acknowledge that they, that Google is, you know, stealing their data to a certain extent, then they may just deal with it or they're not going to do anything about it because they're just very, you know, they prefer the convenience of using Google because mm-hmm. it's so convenient and they get everything done in just one place and such. So it's a, you know, like a very hard switch for most people, I would imagine. Just yeah, we're, we're, I'm working on a strategy with some other people, uh, some Google whistleblowers and others to create an alternative search engine. Actually, that's using Quant as its primary component, mm-hmm. but then also having some whitelisted sites. Mm-hmm. So we're in beta testing at this point, compiling something. And once we compile it, and if I get it successful, I'll certainly let you know about it. So that there will be an alternative search engine out there that you can use. And if you want to find the truth about any topic, you can find that, you know, I'll, we'll have the sites that were censored by Google in here. Mm-hmm. And we won't have the sites like WebMD and <laughs> Healthline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's pretty, <laughs> that doesn't really make any sense at all. Like, uh, the uh, big pharma own websites just uh, yeah. selling, selling or retargeting ads for drugs. Yeah, and, and you know, if, if, if we were to do that with supplements, we'd go to jail. But it's, and it's illegal for to do what they're doing, mm-hmm. but they get away with it because they're in bed with the federal regulatory agencies. Mm-hmm. And, and Google gets away with their monopoly. So it is the biggest monopoly in the world, but many people don't know that the, one of their chief lobbyists is now the head of the Department of Justice. So how are you going to prosecute them wow. when you know they're in bed with the federal government? You can't. I mean, they're. I mean, they, these Google guys are incredibly sophisticated, incredibly smart. They are not stupid. Mm-hmm. They've they've thought this through. They know what they're doing. So they've got some pretty powerful strategies, and it's difficult to get them. But you know, once once you educate the public about this through these types of communications, then they begin to understand. And they can change their behavior because ultimately. 
they rely on us to follow what they're they're saying that and that a significant percentage of the population doesn't follow it then you know they're in trouble yeah that's true um when is the uh, emf book coming out and uh, wh where can people get it P uh it's going to be in a very obscure pl places but probably one of the more popular ones is amazon mm -hmm. amazon.com and um it comes out in February, the end of February, I believe, is it's targeted for. And I think you should be able to pre-order it really soon, if not now. Uh, now, for those who are intrigued with this and want to learn more, because we just literally, I think I've talked two or three minutes about how to mitigate these EMF exposures. But the chapter seven in my book is really extensive. And, and I consulted with some of the leading EMF remediation experts in the world to to for to compile this chapter and i'm giving most of that chapter away for free and you can get it by going to emf.mercola.com emf.mercola.com and you can download a pdf and uh, it will give you really what you need to do if you already understand that the issue is you realize that emf exposure is is dangerous and you need to mm -hmm. limit your uh, exposures as best you can then this is the chapter you want to get Right. That's, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Uh, is there anything like anything else that you would like to add or we didn't cover about this topic? Well, you know, I, I think to extend on the fact, usually when I'm presenting this live, I ask the audience to all stand up and then, then look at their cell phone and then to see if it's an airplane mode. And if it's not, to, if it is to sit down and most audiences, 95% to 99% of the audience remain standing. <laughs> You know, it, yeah. it, it, because, and these are these are not like lay public audiences. These are healthcare professionals. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's it's really important to understand that this is something you have completely under control. And one of the last things you ever want to do is keep your cell phone on your body when it's not in airplane mode. There's yeah. just no reason for that. You're just asking for trouble. There's no exactly. reason for it. Yeah. And you know, I've got a, the new iPhone. So it's got a long battery, and. Uh, since my phone is in airplane mode, it I really only charge like once every 10 days to two weeks. That's it. <laughs> yeah. It's literally, I lose less than 10% a day. Yeah. And that is the benefit when you're not doing it. But you got to look at the other side. Well, I have to charge my phone every day. It not only is that inconvenient, and some people twice a day or even more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you got to wonder, you're putting energy into that phone. What happened to the energy? I mean, if you were using your flashlight on your phone, that some of it would go there, but most people are using it as a radio frequency transmitter. Mm -hmm. So that means the energy is going out to the, creating these EMFs in your local environment. And all the energy that you charged your phone with is bombarding your body with pernicious radio frequencies. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, don't put your phone in airplane mode and you know, do, do those things. Download the chapter because there's so many more things that you can do. Uh, that are and get a meter. The Acousticom too is is really it's under two hundred dollars. It's on Amazon too, and uh, it'll it'll open your eyes. You won't believe what's around you, but you you know and and you think you've done a good job. You've done, you've implemented all these strategies, and then you turn the meter on. You say, Oh my gosh, I had no <laughs> idea that thing was on there. You know, but you forgot yeah. about it. it was three years ago, and it's going yeah. radiating your entire household. Yeah. And uh, like, uh, definitely don't want to use the uh, phone near your testicles or something like that because for guys, it's definitely going to lower your testosterone. And uh, yeah, yeah, like I'm talking to you in a wired connection right now. And then when I have a phone, I mean, almost I, I, I stay at home most of the time because I have an EMF sanctuary. But when I'm t talking to the phone, it's a landline. That's actually not mm -hmm. a landline. The equivalent of a landline, it's a voice over IP. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I can talk over a wire and I don't have any RF exposure as a mm -hmm. result. Yeah, one thing I definitely cringe every time I see is the uh, the wireless Bluetooth headphones. <laughs> oh <laughs> like yes, the, that's another those good are, one. Yes. Those, are, those are the worst ones. Like literally, like frying your yeah, own right brain. Yeah, right in the time. your brain. Yes, I picked up <laughs> in my slide presentation. I have a photograph of Tim Cook photoshopped wearing iPods. Is to the best, and it was an article published in The Verge. That there's never been any documented photos of him actually wearing iPods <laughs> or AirPods, rather. You yeah. know. Uh, I mean, he, he's probably more EMF literate than most of us would lend, tend to believe. So he never wears them. But, but if you walk through an airport, you will be shocked at how many people are wearing these things. It's, it's yeah. a significant percentage. I think it's over 10%. 
Now, they're great devices from the perspective of the quality and the convenience. I mean, it's hard to beat. It really is a very clever and sophisticated product. But, but from a danger perspective, it's one of the last things you want to do. Is, but these, blue leaf, these Bluetooth frequencies, even if it's low-power Bluetooth, is still dangerous. It's very dangerous, yeah. especially if it's on all the time. You're yeah. gonna, it's on 12, 16, 18 hours a day in their head. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy, yeah. <laughs> yes yeah, so insane and people are definitely like i think uh, everyone should uh, like educate themselves about these topics and uh looking forward to your book it's probably gonna be a good one yes well thank you Seem. i really appreciate the opportunity to dialogue with you about this i think it's an important topic definitely and uh yeah uh, my, my last question is gonna be you know what's this one piece of advice or habit you wish you started sooner since the last time we talked like which was a few since months the ago last time we talked hmm. yeah that's a good one because, you know, there's a lot that, you know, I wish I'd started when I was much younger. But I think, I don't know that if I was doing blood flow restriction training when we talked mm. last. I don't right. think I did. So that is, I'm just beyond jazz. And if people want to learn more about this, they can go to bfr.mercola.com and get a similar, a similar, it's a 30-page PDF with four or five videos I put together to tell people how to do it and the benefits and the science behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, so... I'm, I'm really jazzed about that. There's no question. But I, I've also started on low deuterium. And mm. in fact, uh, I have my, you're familiar with deuterium, right? Yeah. Deuterium yeah. Issue. So I actually have my deuterium levels tested and I actually hold the U.S. record now. Oh, really? Lowest deuterium level tested. Yeah. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Yeah. So I actually was able to cut it in by half. Now, I think that was too much. Like most of the things, I'd get obsessive compulsive. <laughs> but I think it probably shouldn't be as low as I got it. And so I'm actually trying to get it back up now. Right. <laughs> what you're doing then eating grains or <laughs> no 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 deuterium is is primarily in the water i mean if you were to tell my guess is because you're so optimized for your mitochondria you're probably most people are 150 you're probably about 120 maybe 150 maybe 125 but you're you're you're, you're in a healthy range i would think but i got it down to 77 by drinking deuterium depleted water so mm. now instead of drinking 10 parts per million i'm drinking like 80 parts per million so mm. it should be back up to higher levels soon Okay, well, that's uh, <laughs> we definitely have to do another podcast in a few months to uh, talk yeah, about yeah, yeah. BFR and deuterium and yeah, and, yeah, a uh, lot of other cool things. And this <laughs> morning, we're talking about a bulletproof too. I'm yeah. put my top two dozen biohacks. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you're going or upgrade lab. I'm sure you're going this year. So that's where yeah. we first met last year. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Yeah, yeah, Chris Shades booth in Quicksilver. So yeah, <laughs> we'll meet there. All right, that's it for this episode. If you want to support us, then make sure you leave us a review on iTunes and the other social media platforms. To learn more about the topics that we discussed in this episode, check out the show notes in the description. But other than that, thanks for listening. My name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.